in, in, the, in the Russian style. So you have a lot of the uh, medical details for us. So um, we have a, a multidisciplinary panel. Um, they'll be able to provide a number of, of perspectives, um, and I think it'll be a very interesting talk. So I'll turn it over to Judy. All right, thanks very much, Alec. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Heimer for uh, coming down to Washington today. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thanks very much to the Human Rights Campaign, a very appropriate venue for this conversation. So my job is to be brief um, and just to set some overall context for Professor Heimer's remarks today. So uh, for anyone who's not familiar with the course of the HIV epidemic in Russia up to this point, um, the first cases of HIV were first detected back when Russia was the Soviet Union, uh, but the epidemic really exploded back in the mid-1990s and it coincided with the growth of injection drug use in Russia. And to this day, the HIV epidemic in Russia remains predominantly driven by people who inject drugs. Uh, right now, uh, about a couple months ago, there was a threshold of sorts crossed when the number of officially reported cases of HIV in Russia crossed the one million mark. Um, there's reason to believe that that number is not entirely accurate for a whole lot of reasons, um, one of which uh, is that there are many disincentives for people who are infected with HIV or think they may be infected with HIV to report that as such. And that brings me to the overall way in which I think it's appropriate to frame the discussion today, and that is fundamentally as a human rights issue, because the groups who are most likely to contract or transmit HIV in Russia are groups whose human rights are grossly abused in that society. They're groups of people who are marginalized, who are discriminated against, either by the government or by society as a whole. Um, one of those groups, as I already mentioned, is injection drug users, and we'll learn a lot more about their situation from Professor Heimer today. Um, those groups face not only uh, threat of HIV because of their drug use and the fact that harm reduction programs are virtually non-existent in Russia, uh, but also because of comorbidity with so many other um, it, diseases and situations, including hepatitis, uh, tuberculosis, including multidrug resistant tuberculosis, which is very much a factor in Russia in particular, um, alcohol use and, um, and other kinds of addictions. And so I think that's what we'll be hearing about most from Professor Heimer today. Um, I should mention also that men who have sex with men are a risk group in Russia about which we know very little. Uh, back in 2013, the Russian government passed legislation uh, that made it a criminal offense to engage in what is known as homosexual propaganda. That took the very little bit of NGO activity, uh, education activity on websites, and drove it back underground again. And so if you are a gay man or a man who has sex with men in Russia, there are many kinds of disincentives, including the threat of criminal penalties, for you even to seek information about HIV. That's, uh, that's related to your situation. And so that is certainly one uh, risk group whose human rights are grossly abused in the country. Um, I should also mention a very recent uh, acceleration of the damaging political context for HIV in Russia, and that is the situation surrounding the labeling of many non-governmental organizations in Russia as foreign agents. When in Russia is a brand that has all kinds of connotations of illegal espionage activity, um, you know, ac activity underground on behalf of, uh, of an evil, threatening West um, or Western world. Um, to date, since the uh, anti-NGO legislation was passed in Russia back in 2012, about 130 different non-governmental organizations have been branded with this label of foreign agent. Up until recently, health organizations have mostly been exempt from worry about this because the threat of being branded a, as a foreign agent is limited in the Russian law to institutions that engage in political activity. And until recently, health activity has fallen outside that sphere of political activity. Um, but in 2016, uh, back in February, we saw a very small HIV AIDS service organization in Siberia branded with that foreign agent label. And then even more worrisome um, is just a couple of weeks ago, there were two very significant HIV AIDS NGOs uh, that were branded with the foreign agent label. Um, one is an umbrella group for HIV organizations across the country called Esvero. Um, and the other is the Andrei Rokoff Foundation, which is pretty much the only harm reduction uh, services organization in Moscow. Um, it serves about 6,000 clients a year 
with uh, clean needle exchange, um, trying to promote information about the possibility of substitution therapy, methadone, as a harm reduction measure for people who inject drugs. Um, the Andre Rokoff Foundation has gone back to the government and asked for clarification of exactly what activities it has engaged in that have it now branded with this foreign agent label. And it was given a small list of activities, all of which were related to lobbying for the legalization of methadone or other opioid substitution medications um, and distributing information via its website about the existence of opioid substitution um, medication. So that seems to be what's pulled it into um, what is now branded as harmful political activity within the Russian context that has it um, probably over the next year or two fighting for its life um, in terms of its ability to survive as an organization labeled as such in this environment. Um, so just to, again, provide some human rights context for the epidemic, um, this is an epidemic, um, as we've seen with the HIV epidemic around the world, um, in which marginalization and in many cases criminalization of people's identities and their activities um, has put them more at risk for HIV. And uh, for people who inject drugs, that's precisely the kind of thing that we hear about from Professor Heimer. So thanks very much, and please welcome Professor Heimer today. That set the stage very nicely for my talk. Thank you, Judith. Um, today, I think what I will do is in a, give a talk. I think I hope it should last about 30 minutes, and then we can have time for, for uh, questions and conversation. But I'm going to start with a brief overview of, of the epidemiological situation in Russia as a whole and in St. Petersburg and Kazan, two cities where I've done a good bit of work. I'm going to integrate findings from several different studies. Um, looking at the treatment cascade among people who inject drugs, uh, looking at some medical uh, treatment data on adherence and viral load suppression, uh, adherence in patients um, who are just initiating antiretroviral therapy, and about increasing efforts to reach and treat the HIV-positive drug users. Uh, some summary and, and conclusions at the end. But starting with the epidemiologic background, um, this is a, a graph of the HIV cases reported uh, officially in Russia with the epidemic that started in the 1996 among injection drug users. There was a, an early spike of about for several years. Um, then fewer cases were reported. As Judy said, the number of total cases now exceeds uh, one million. But the number of cases that have been reported every year went through this decline, but is now in a second phase, a second wave. And in fact, in both 2014, there were more cases reported that year than in any previous year. And the same is true again in 2015. And so far in 2016, we're probably on a, a trajectory to exceed even this number of, of 93, 94,000 cases re reported to the government. Uh, in, in a single year, which is a continued increase in this epidemic um, throughout the country, occurring in, in, in many of the same old places, but also in new places, especially uh, in Siberia, where uh, in parts of Siberia that have previously not seen much of an epidemic. Um, the question that, that arises from looking at official statistics is, is the epidemic expanding rapidly uh, into the, the general population through heterosexual transmission or is it still concentrated among people who inject drugs? Um, federal surveillance data, um, which is the data that appeared in the previous slide, suggests an increase in heterosexual transmission, but you have to ask the question is, are these surveillance statistics reliable? And the answer seems to be probably not, and if you look at the, at the table below, you'll see, the, if you look at the table, you'll see that a large number of cases have unknown route of transmission. Mm -hmm. So e at, even as the uh, percentage of cases attributable to injection drug use have declined, the percentage of cases of unknown origin or unattributable origin have increased. Um, this is probably because, and, and Judy alluded to this, is that there are lots of reasons why drug users are not having their HIV status d 
detected. Uh, if there's no effective treatment for your addiction, and there is none in Russia, there's no reason to seek treatment. Uh, you become known as a case, if you, if you test HIV positive, you get attributed, that gets attributed to injection drug use if you're tested at a drug treatment facility. If you're not going to a drug treatment facility, then you're not going to be listed as an injection drug user. It, it's as simple as that. We're not seeing it. We're not seeing this, this steady level in injection drug users because the drug users are not presenting themselves to this system for testing if they are being tested, and they are they being tested in other venues. So there is, and Judy also mentioned this, there is a, a phenomenon called a syndemic. A syndemic is been defined as when multiple epidemics of different diseases and conditions all come together to make the situation even worse. And that's certainly the case in Russia with HIV and, and drug abuse. And so I guess one would conclude from a, a deeper analysis of the data that it's still uh, 50 to 70 percent of all cases currently occurring are in people with a history of or currently injecting drugs. And this is the, the graph on the, on the right is a, a, a model we did of HIV prevalence uh, in St. Petersburg, taking existing data, um, starting with estimates in, in our studies of HIV prevalence and estimating it, this study is now, um, you know, uh, was, was published in 2013, the data come from 2010, so estimating the course of the epidemic over the next uh, 15 years or so. And what you can see is that if you continue to allow transmission among injection drug users by not treating them, by not improving prevention, that what you end up with is a curve where eventually almost 5% of the population of the city of, adult population of the city of St. Petersburg is HIV positive. That's, that's a generalized epidemic. Uh, it will be the first generalized epidemic ever to have occurred outside of sub-Saharan Africa, and the first one to have originated in populations of injection drug use. So Russia, as everybody knows, is unique in many ways. This is another way of the, in which it's unique, not a particularly glowing one. However, if we could get all the drug users into treatment, what would happen is that HIV transmission would go down, and uh, incidents would stop, and actually you could level off prevalence, but that would require prioritizing treatment of injection drug users, something that's not happening now in Russia, with one or two exceptions. Um, oh, there we go. So this is data from St. Petersburg among injection drug users. We've seen a continual increase in HIV prevalence in populations of drug users. When we first started doing uh, our work in the, in the late 1990s, prevalence in injection drug users was 2%. The next time we did it, 11, then 19, 30, 44, 53, and now it's leveled off the last time we did it. 56% in 2013 and 14 in a sample of almost 1,000 drug users from the city. As I said earlier, this is a syndemic. There are multiple epidemics happening at the same time. The epidemic of hepatitis C is even more severe. Uh, hepatitis C prevalence in injection drug users is all but ubiquitous. This uh, slide compares St. Petersburg to other cities that have experienced uh, HIV epidemics concentrated in injection drug users, comparing New York and St. Petersburg and Vancouver. Um, what's interesting is that the epidemic curves at the beginning in terms of increasings in prevalence and initial incidence look very similar. What's happened after that is interesting. <laughs> Um, you'll notice that in New York and in St. Petersburg, the prevalence among drug users has reached almost the same level at, at its maximum. Uh, the reason it got so high in New York was that many of these cases occurred actually before we even knew there was HIV. We, uh, you know, the infections were occurred before the, the people started getting sick with AIDS. 
uh, by the time we had the first cases of, of AIDS identified in 1981, HIV prevalence in drug users was already higher than 40%. And so it went up and, and, and stayed at this plateau until effective harm reduction programs were set up in New York. Uh, in advance of successful treatment for HIV. So what you see is a declining prevalence after that because there was no way to, to prevent the people who were already infected from dying. So what you're seeing in this declining prevalence uh, is a die off at not, and not replacement by new infections. So HIV prevention in New York worked. Unfortunately, it took us a long time to do this. In contrast, in Vancouver, they experienced an outbreak in the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, slightly before the Russian outbreak. Uh, and what you can see is that they responded much more quickly and prevalence leveled at 20%. And it stayed at that level of 20% of drug users infected because we now have treatment to keep people alive and Vancouver has prioritized treating people. And in fact, there are very few HIV-related deaths among drug users in Vancouver these days. The slight decline is because there are some new people who are entering the population who are not getting infected, but the decline is going to be very slow. Um, when you look at incidence, which is the number of new cases in any given year, you can see New York, because it was the, this all occurred before uh, the uh, you know we even knew about HIV, and then declined. Uh, I was talking at, at its peak, there were probably. 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 new infections every year. Most recent data from New York, um, talked to a colleague, uh, was in the data from 2014, there were 35 new cases detected among drug users. Prevention works, there's no question about that. And Vancouver sees the same thing. Uh, after an initial increase, increase in, in access to needle exchange and a wide range of, of drug user services, uh, incidence is virtually zero. Um, so why is this not happening in Russia? Um, and the reasons for that is that there is no effective treatment for drug addiction in Russia. Drugs of abuse are predominantly opioids, uh, mostly heroin. Uh, the effective treatments are banned by Russian law. You may not use opioid substitution therapy to treat. Um, what they're left with is, is, is detoxification, which doesn't work. Um, in fact, we're at, at an interesting point in history right now. It's the 100th anniversary of the first study in the United States showing that detox didn't work. And it's true all over the world. It's, you know, where you live is irrelevant. Detox fails about 90 to 95% within six months. So there is no effective treatment in Russia. Um, the Russian treatment guidelines, reiterated yet again recently, um, is that um, treatment for HIV with antiretroviral medication should be denied until a person is abstinent for six months. Of course, if you try to be abstinent today, six months from now, you stand a 90% chance of not being abstinent anymore. So basically, this policy precludes drug users from getting antiretroviral treatment. There are a few locations in Russia that have policies counter to this federal guidance, but limited access to medications has forced care providers to choose who they're going to give their medications to, um, or, to or, or risk running out of medications and then having to take people off of them. I will talk about a case of that uh, in Kazan later in my talk. But I also want to mention, while I'm thinking about it, that just yesterday I learned that the same thing is now happening again in St. Petersburg, that they've run out of medications for the year. And so they have to start figuring out how, who to take off of treatment, um, which of course promotes drug resistance, promotes disease progression, and um, puts people's lives at stake. Uh, so um, we're going to focus now a little bit on St. Petersburg and HIV care delivery. Um, the big, uh, this uh, meeting today, I guess, was put together in anticipation of the uh, International AIDS Conference, which begins next week in Durban, and the big uh, push at, at, in the international AIDS community is 
is a, is a strategy called 90-90-90, getting 90% of the people in the world who are HIV positive, knowing their status, 90% of those people into medical care, and 90% of the people in medical care on antiretrovirals. So the focus of, of HIV prevention and treatment in the world is focusing on treatment and getting people onto drugs because what we've shown is that people whose viral load is suppressed with these drugs, not only do they stay healthy and can stay healthy for the rest of their lives, but they don't transmit the virus to others. So we have a, 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 a paradigm called a treatment is prevention, and it works. So HIV care is delivered at multiple locations in the city. The biggest uh, treatment center is the City, <coughs> the city AIDS Center, uh, which is located near the center of the city. Um, there's some treatment at the Bakken Infectious Disease Hospital, which is also centrally located. And more recently, there are polyclinics that have been set up in multiple districts. Um, most of those are a great remove from, from the AIDS Center, so it makes it easier for people to, who live in those outlying districts to get there. Uh, as of 2013, and the numbers remain fairly constant, about 6,000 of the 50,000 plus registered HIV positive residents of St. Petersburg are receiving regular care. Um, that is to say they go at least every, every year for a, a physical a checkup at, at one of the AIDS care centers. Fewer of them are actually receiving antiretroviral medications probably less than half. This is actually the, what we call the treatment cascade in injection drug users from a sample of, of 800 injection drug users who we recruited from seven districts in St. Petersburg. Um, of those 800 people, uh, 452 tested HIV positive. The one piece of good news in this cascade is that many of them 80%, more than 80%, know they're HIV positive. So they've been tested and they've been told of their diagnosis. The bad news is that very, very few of them, only a little more than 20%, are in regular care, as I defined it. And even, even worse, uh, only 10%, only what, that less than 10%, 9% of the people who are HIV positive, or the drug users who are positive, are currently receiving antiretroviral medications as of uh, when this study was, was completed, the data collection ended early in 2014. So that's two years ago. Things have changed appreciably in St. Petersburg since then, so that's sort of why my, my, my talk is entitled A Glimmer of Good News. Um, we do know why people don't access care, why only 6,000 people of the 50,000 people come to the AIDS Center. And one of the biggest reasons is, a, is, is stigma both HIV-related stigma and drug-related stigma. And we identified and, and looked for two different forms of stigma. One is internalized stigma. That is, because of who I am, I believe I am not worthy. And the second is experience stigma. That is, I've actually had a stigmatizing or discriminating uh, uh, event I can talk about. And for each of these categories of stigma, for both drug use and for HIV infection. Uh, we asked six questions about stigma. So you could have zero if you experience no stigma, six if you experienced all six forms of stigma. And you can see in the, in the chart at the bottom that, that for internalized stigma, uh, for experienced stigma, for drug use, or for HIV, the, the, the mean score is that people have experienced somewhere between three and a half and four of the six stigmatizing events. So clearly stigma is a huge problem. Um, all of these uh, were associated with <coughs> depression. Uh, internalized stigma for both drug use and HIV and anticipated stigma for um, for HIV, so three of the four categories of stigma were associated with failure to receive regular care in this population. And um, combined with depression, this means that these people were less healthy, uh, and, but also less likely to receive HIV care. So basically we seem to be offering care to um, people who probably lead it 
I shouldn't say need at least, that's, that's not quite fair, but we're certainly missing the people who could benefit from it the most. Now these are, again, these are the data that we collected in 2013 and 14. What's happened since then? Um, the aid center has tried to prioritize improving treatment. Uh, they have done so by opening these district um, polyclinics. Uh, patients who use those polyclinics were more likely to have their viral load suppressed, so their treatment appears to be better at these clinics in, the, in their community. Um, the patients who had undetectable viral loads were more likely to be female, uh, married, better educated, better educated, and to um, less likely to be experiencing legal problems, more likely to be experiencing family problems. I don't know why that that came out. That's just one of those things you do. You do epidemiology, you find things that you can't always explain. We're in the process of hoping to be able to go back and do a little more work on this uh, if, if our grant applications get funded. Um, but what was interesting was that neither substance abuse nor any of the psychiatric problems that we tested for specifically were associated with viral load suppression. To put it another way, drug use is not a bar once you're in treatment to succeeding in having your viral load suppressed and therefore not only being able to remain healthy but you will not be transmitting the virus to other people. So we then ask the question, who is actually starting antiretroviral medications in St. Petersburg? Um, we did a, a, a clinical series of 100 patients uh, who were offered the opportunity to start. We interviewed them between the time they were told they could start and the time they made their first visit to pick up medications. So we could ask, did they initiate treatment? Were they retained in treatment for six months? And was their viral load suppressed at the end of the six months? So of the 100 people, um, 96 people of the 100 started antiretrovirals. 80 were retained in care for six months, and 57 had undetectable loads. What was interesting is we asked physicians to predict which patients uh, would be retained and which ones would be adherent based on what they knew about the patients. They were unable to predict at all um, who, who, you know, who would be adherent patients and who wouldn't, um, meaning that this decision should not be left up to physicians but should be made by people who seek care and, 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 and all of them should be treated essentially equally. Um, <coughs> retention in care was associated with being older, being better educated, and, be, and having a, a claiming or, or reporting at baseline that they would be adherent, that they had better self-efficacy for remaining in care. And so patients are better at predicting than physicians. Um, uh, that's retention. Adherence was again associated with being better educated and also less need for emergency medical care, which really we take as a marker of those people who were doing badly were less able to remain adherent. Um, what was interesting was that neither past nor current drug users was associated with either poor retention or adherence. Another reason why there's no reason to deny care for drug users despite what the Russian guidelines recommend. Um, the bad news um, about treatment in St. Petersburg is that the system is overwhelmed, can offer care or offers care to only one in ten people currently infected. Drug users are underrepresented among those in care. Uh, physicians are poor at predicting who will remain in care. And as I just learned yesterday, so it's not even on this slide, they're running out of drugs. Uh, the good news is that this decentralization, which started in two neighborhoods, is now expanded to six outlying districts, so more local, local treatment is available, which is a good sign. Um, again, pilot studies, and I'm going to repeat this over and over again, pilot studies suggest that drug users and non-drug users are equally retained in care and equally adherent, so there's no reason not to prioritize care for injection drug users. Um, this is just a thank you slide to all the people who are involved, so you don't think I do all this work myself. I have teams of, of, of people who we've trained through our, our training grant uh, from the Forward International Center at NIH, those young scientists and, 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 and physicians 
are um, highlighted in yellow, um, along with my, my local colleagues who are there uh, in, uh, in, in italics and, and my, co my Yale colleagues. Um, but let's look at what happens when you do try to prioritize treatment for drug users. That's happened in Kazan, in Tartistan. Um, Tartistan is really fascinating because Kazan was one of the first places to try to introduce harm reduction into Russia, and they succeeded in controlling their HIV epidemic to some extent. Um, when I first went there and we started working with them, they were in the process of doing a seroprevalence survey in 2005. They identified no cases among the participants at their needle exchange program, or syringe exchange program, SEP, um, who they didn't know were already uh, infected in a study they'd done three years earlier. So the syringe exchange program was preventing new infections. And during the second decade of the epidemic, in the, in the 10 years since my, my earliest trips there, while the Russian epidemic has increased uh, uh, dramatically uh, in terms of the number of diagnoses and the diagnoses per 100,000 people, um, the increase in Tartistan has been much more modest and, and the population prevalence is, is just over half of what it is in other parts of Russia. Now it's true that there are lots of other places in Russia that, that have low prevalence at the Republic or the, or the, or the, the Oblast level, but, but Tartistan did have a, a, uh, an outbreak at the very beginning of the epidemic of HIV in the late 90s. That epidemic has been held in check because of policies and practices that have been, uh, that have occurred in, in Tardistan. And, and this was done by widespread adoption of syringe access through needle exchange programs, through district level provision of services like I described in St. Petersburg, and by case management for HIV positives coupled with expansion of antiretroviral care in three of the seven districts within the city of Kazan. Um, the, the, the syringe exchange in Kazan was, was run by a, um, a, a non-governmental organization called Project Renewal, uh, associated with the Tartistan Ministry of Health. They empirically developed a three-pronged strategy, so there were fixed sites in the AIDS center and, and the local poly, 13 or so local polyclinics in the area. They had mobile services that went out on the road where uh, commercial sex workers uh, would, would uh, meet uh, their, their customers, um, providing condoms, HIV testing, a warm place to, to sit in the van for a few minutes. I was out there one very cold night. It was a, a pleasure to be able to, to sit in the van um, after walking the streets for a bit, both for me and, of course, for the, for the women who were working. Um, and then their most effective method was secondary exchange, where they identified gate, gatekeepers at places where people congregated to inject drugs in, and instructed them and provided them with the equipment they needed to teach safe injection and to provide clean injection supplies. So this three-pronged system worked for a long time until they ran out of money. Um, at the same time, or slightly later, um, they developed a, a treatment program based on building drop-in centers. Um, uh, this drop-in center is open most of the day. Uh, the drop-in center allows patients or, or, or people who are coming in, many of whom are drug users, to either interact with staff or just relax if they wanted to. A wide range of services were offered, um, and if they needed uh, medical care, they could get on-site care, antiretroviral therapy through scheduled visits with any of the three physicians, or if they needed specialized care. So they set this up in three neighborhoods. Uh, in, in those three neighborhoods, the difference in the number of people receiving care in a one-year period um, almost doubled in two of the neighborhoods, increased by 60% in the third neighborhood, whereas there was very little change, although there was some improvement in, 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 in the other four neighborhoods that weren't served as well by this service. Um, the, the, the major problem with this uh, expansion of service is that no good deed goes unpunished. 
And what happened was there were drug shortages um, in 2009 and 2010 that required triaging patients off of medications for a four or five month period. So they simply didn't have the medications. They asked around, do, could any of the other, because medications were distributed cent centrally um, at, the, at, the, at the province level. Um, could, could, could anybody else give them the medications they needed? And the answer, of course, was no, because if you give away your medications, that means you don't need them and your allocation will be cut the following year. So obviously there was no help available. Um, at the same time uh, that, that this, or just after this was happening, um, funding from international sources decreased and the number of districts currently being served is now one, not three. So um, those are the two places where I've done most of my work. Um, you know, I have been working in Russia for 15 years and I do keep looking for reasons for optimism. Uh, occasionally, as I've tried to mention here, there are some hopeful signs, but these are few and far between, I do have to admit. And there certainly is no national momentum to implement proven methods to halt this endemic spread of, of opioid abuse, HIV, hepatitis C, TB, and other related infections. Uh, in spite of this, um, there are many well-meaning and conscientious individuals who continue to struggle to address these issues and, and my hope does lie with them and with some of the people we've, young, young scientists and, and physicians we've trained over the course of the last 15 years. Um, I think that's it. Just wanna thank some of the people who, who were helpful in conducting these studies and um, I'm certainly you know, open and ready for a conversation and any, any specific questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Robert, I think Alec has indicated to me that um, as moderator, I get the first couple questions. So um, I, I'm going to okay. shoot first uh -huh. here. Um, I'd like to ask you, first of all, about your methodology and your experience doing research on these issues in Russia. Um, so two um, maybe unrelated questions. One is thinking about one of the first studies that you mentioned, those 800 drug users that you worked with in St. Petersburg. Um, in a, a legal environment like this, in a political environment like this, how do you go about recruiting 800 drug users for an academic study? And then more broadly, um, I'd just be interested in knowing since the political climate has become more harsh for NGOs and others dealing with these issues, and we know that academic researchers partnering with Russian colleagues uh, across a wide range of scientific disciplines have found their environment to be more, more restricted, um, receiving, receiving a little more unwanted attention from the government and the federal security services in the last couple of years. Have you noticed a change in the overall environment and in any governmental um, you know, unwanted attention to or interference with the work that you do? Okay, first on methodology. Um, when we recruit people from hidden populations where there is no sampling frame, you cannot do random sampling. So what we do is we definitely use a form of convenience sampling, but one that takes advantage of existing social networks among people who use drugs. And so partnering with local NGOs who, who are respected and provide services to the people um, who are interested in recruiting, and we've done work with drug users, we've done work with MSM, we've done work with commercial sex workers, but find and, and build relations with the NGO. Um, we can then use the NGO to identify some people they know. We recruit them into the study, um, and we use a, a tool called respondent-driven sampling where we ask the, the, the people we recruit into the study to serve as our recruiters for the next wave of, of recruitment. And we use a dual incentive approach, a modest incentive, um, paying them for participation in the study, remunerating them for their time, and we remunerate them modestly for uh, anyone they successfully recruit to the study. And in this way, um, you know, we recruited 800 drug users in seven districts in a course of four months. Um, it, we did a parallel study at the same time in, in Estonia across the border uh, from the St. Petersburg region. Uh, and uh, we recruited 600 drug users in about four and a half weeks. 
So this works if you have a good relationship with the community, um, which we work very hard to, to, to maintain. Um, we, of course, share our results with them. Uh, we, we share our recommendations. We help train their staff uh, as best we can. Uh, even in difficult situations, we have managed to, to continue to do this without much police harassment. Um, in, in, in at least in places like St. Petersburg and Kazan, it might be a little harder in some of the more uh, difficult to work in regions, especially this is true in, in Moscow, uh, which has uh, an incredibly backward approach on so many levels toward the, the syndemic. Um, we also have worked very, very hard over more than a decade to build collaborations with the, with the physicians who provide AIDS care, the infectionists, and, uh, and related, related medical care providers. Uh, we first started recommending the idea of decentralizing care from the AIDS Center to district polyclinics back in 2004, 2005. It took a decade for them to, to listen, but they finally do, and they were rewarded um, by doing so by very positive results. So you, you, again, you have ways of building of confidence. Um, when I presented, and colleagues of mine presented, um, the modeling data that I, I showed you at a conference in St. Petersburg, which was attended by the head of the AIDS Center in Moscow, uh, he had been invited to be the co-chair of the session, and he immediately laced into us and said, but this doesn't make any sense. We don't see anything like this in Moscow. How dare you do this? Um, the head of the AIDS Center in St. Petersburg basically said to him, listen, you do things in Moscow your way. We do things in St. Petersburg our way. So we have the explicit, not just the implicit, but the explicit support of the local um, you know, professionals, which really helps. So to follow that up with a social science question, um, so you know, you've spoken of the, your experience in St. Petersburg and Kazan, where in St. Petersburg there's been movement forward, broadly defined in terms of decentralization of care into these innovative uh, neighborhood uh, polyclinics, uh, you know, at least a focus on treatment in Kazan. Obviously, they've gone much further, and we haven't even talked about the uh, situation with substitution therapy in Kazan and, and the voices there that have uh, been pretty strong in encouraging legalization of methadone. Um, and it's pretty clear reading between the lines of your remarks that places like St. Petersburg and Kazan attempting to move forward are the exception rather than the rule in Russia. And reading even further between the lines, it sounds as though it might be you know, specific leadership in those regions, in the in city of St. Petersburg and in Kazan uh, City that's making that happen. But I'm wondering if I could ask that question directly. Why do you see um, within this overall picture of regional variation in Russia in approach to the epidemic, um, why do you see some places that seem to be at least taking a shot at doing it better than others? Wasn't it Tip O'Neill who said all politics are local? Um, and so it does require local leadership, and it requires a willingness to, to buck the trend. And certainly St. Petersburg has that tradition. So that's not terribly surprising. Um, as for Tatarstan, it too has a tradition of independence. So they're, they're they're more fortunate. Um, they also have very good med university systems and medical university systems. And there is something about, about uh, an educated uh, leadership that, that, that matters a lot. Uh, they, you know, my experience with the, with the head of the AIDS Center in, in, in St. Petersburg is, is, is uh, in a way illustrative of this. You know, I go and I say, I think we should do this. And he says, no, it can't be done. And then we sit down and figure out, well, maybe, it, maybe it's not impossible, but just highly improbable. Maybe it's not improbable, but it's risky. Maybe it's risky, but maybe it's worth doing. And over the course of time, uh, and vodka, and dinners, and um, 
training his people and bringing people to his conferences to, um, to educate his, his staff of physicians and, and social workers and psychologists. Um, we can uh, make uh, uh, a, a, an agreement uh, almost, and this is implicit, not explicit, that why not try something different? If you can show me that what we're doing isn't working, let's try something different. And I think there's great resistance, uh, we see it here in the US, the US and Russia are not that different in that regard. Um, there's great resistance to trying something new when you don't have a good reason to do it. Uh, you know, uh, when, I, when I was doing some education about harm reduction to the police in, in, in my home state of Connecticut, I went to the head of the police department in, in the city of Stamford and said, listen, we need to expand needle exchange here. Uh, here's what harm reduction is all about. And he put his hand up and said, stop, stop. You don't have to tell me. I, I understand harm reduction. You have to convince me why I should stick my neck out. And I think um, the penalties for sticking your neck out in Russia can be very severe. And, 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 and Kazan and, 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 and St. Petersburg may be a little more fortunate in being able to stick their necks out a little further. But without the resources, as, as I've mentioned, with the stockouts of, of HIV medications and the cutting back of, of clinical services um, in Kazan and the, the reductions in international support for harm reduction programs like needle exchange and, and safe syringe access, um, it gets harder and harder to do that. All right, happy to open up the floor now to, uh, to questions. And Alec, am I right that I should carry the microphone around? Okay, just some idea, so. okay yeah, great. You just announce your name for the affiliation. This guy's on. Kate Bothman, CSIS Russian Eurasia Program intern. Um, I had a sort of in regard to uh, what you had said about uh, the tradition of independence in Kazan and, uh, and St. Petersburg, I think it's also important to um, point out the fact that, uh, for example, uh, Chechnya and Tatarstan were very um, sort of unique in the situation uh, that they were sort of brought back into the Russian Federation sort of separately um, after uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And with that came a lot of um, legal autonomy that was sort of granted as a, as a deal to get them to come back in. So that I think that really plays a factor in um, Kazan. And uh, yeah, that perhaps St. Petersburg, it is more of a tradition, but it also has legal backup um, in, in Tatarstan. But um, my other question was about sort of the, um, origins of the antiretroviral medication. Um, how much of it is made sort of within the post-Soviet space um, or within Russia itself? Um, and I wonder how that uh, has affected access. Uh, currently, none of it's made there. Okay. Currently, it all comes from uh, when, when, when these medications were being rolled out, beginning probably, f and, and, and expansion was occurring worldwide, Russia decided um, they wanted to be a, um, a developed country and uh, were not, did not accept the same kind of deep discounts that were being offered uh, to uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. Um, so they ended up paying a premium, uh, probably five to six times the price for the same drugs that, that were being um, you know, delivered to um, Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, so they could end up treating far fewer people because they would buy centrally and when they'd run out, they'd run out. Okay, so they are currently in the process of trying to build an, an, an indigenous uh, pharmaceutical industry that makes some of these drugs. Um, apparently, from what I just was, was, was told and what Olga Levin, if she had been here, would have mentioned, uh, is that many of these companies that are trying to build this industry have, uh, like so much in Russia, have very strong ties to the Kremlin, and so one worries about the quality of the drugs they'll produce. Um, back to the, the Tartistan issue. Um, I don't know if this is true or not. This is what I was told. 
um, and some of you can correct me because I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, um, a political scientist, but I was told that um, at some point during the Yeltsin regime, the president of the Republic of Tartistan basically promised Yeltsin that Tartistan would not be a Chechnya, that despite the very large Muslim population, he would maintain order in exchange for continued autonomy and, and, and continued um, retention of tax revenues within uh, the republic so it wouldn't be sent out. So yes, there is this tradition. Unfortunately, that you know, Putin has pulled that back quite a bit. So there's much, much less autonomy than there used to be. We'll go here and we'll oh, All right. Ina Dubinsky, Broadcasting Board of Governors, Office of Development. Uh, professor, you said you are not a political scientist, but you are very well known that the AIDS of and uh, HIV and AIDS issue is politicized in Russia. And the problem is being aggravated by worsened economic conditions, sanctions, reduced production of antiretroviral therapy uh, drugs, uh, reduced availability of these drugs to people, uh, increased population of HIV AIDS infected people in penitentiary system, just to name a few, a plethora of things. So uh, what, uh, what is your perception of further developments? Uh, the government, of course, is aware of all these things, uh, but is in denial. So uh, what picture do you see in three, four, like, let's say, by 2020? Well, uh, as, our, as our models suggest, that um, all of these suggest that the epidemic will continue to grow, that people will continue to die at increasingly high rates. It will require a great deal of individual bravery, and I really do mean courage, to, 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 to stem this tide. We will have people trained who can do this if, if that tide turns. But one also has to look at the situation and compare it to the epidemic in the, in, in the United States in the, in, the, in the 1980s, in a way, when no one talked about it. Reagan didn't say the word HIV or AIDS for, for seven of the eight years of his regime. Uh, there was, uh, you know, people, people who were important figures um, died of HIV uh, or HIV-related complications, uh, denying that they were infected. Uh, it's only when some courageous people uh, spoke out and said, "Yes, I am. I am HIV positive. Yes." Um, uh, I deserve better care uh, when, in, did, you know, when, when activist organizations um, took great risks here. Um, now, mind you, I think the risks in the Soviet, in, in, in Russia will be much greater, um, but it's going to have to be a combination of those two things. People are going to, in, in order for things to improve, I really do believe that the people who are infected, who, you know, Whose, whose parents are in power, because this, this is an epidemic of people from, from 20 to 45. There's a real cohort group. It's, it's, it's concentrated in people that age. Uh, their parents are in power. Their they, those people in power have to see their children or their friends' children dying from this. And that, that may make a difference. But it's very hard to do that. Uh, you know, in St. Petersburg, there is, I did not mention it, a parallel treatment system for the people with privilege who are, you know, don't have to be registered as HIV positive. I've, I've talked at length with the head of the AIDS Center about this, and he says, you know, these people need to be protected. And I said, well, you're protecting them, but, but you know, you are, you're also damaging by doing this the the care you can offer to all your other patients. And that choice is yours. Um, and so it's not going to come. That's set somewhere where he's not willing to stick his neck out. But the question is, um, 
will those individuals themselves at some point feel the, feel the compulsion to do that. Thank you. I'm Harley Balser from Georgetown University. Uh, on Tatarstan, you're absolutely right about the independence. Uh, on the 18th of August, 1991, uh, the day before the coup attempt, uh, the, pres the party leader of Tatarstan, Mithin Barshamiyev, flew back from Moscow with a signed agreement that if he supported the putsch, uh, Tatarstan would become the 16th Union Republic of the Soviet Union. Uh, that didn't work out quite the way he expected, but um, you know, he, he's always, you know, the, the Tatar leadership has always been angling for more power. Uh, my question for both of you, I can't resist this opportunity, uh, is about whether the problem is the medical community or the political leadership. Uh, I've had this discussion with a lot of my Russian friends over the years. You know, uh, the Soviet medical profession and the Russian medical profession that succeeded it rejects the needle exchange substitution therapy. On the other hand, the political leadership also seems to have a pretty strong feeling about this. Uh, when Russia took over Crimea, uh, one of the first things they did, you, know, you would think they would have had other priorities, was to shut down the needle exchanges and the methadone clinics. That was not the doctor's orders necessarily. So I'd love it if you could both try to untangle that for me a little bit. You, you started by saying or, but it's and. It is the political ship and the medical leadership. The, the, at, and, and nowhere is this better exemplified than in the, the profession, profession of narcology, which is um, training of people to treat people with addictive disorders, whether it be drugs or alcohol. And um, they are staunchly opposed to substitution therapy for a number of, of reasons. Um, they refuse to recognize that um, opioid abuse disorder is a chronic relapsing condition. Well, we have the same problem here in the US. This is not, this is not uncommon in the medical profession. People, people keep talking in this country so forgive me for the digression, but I don't want to pin all the blame on, 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 on Russia, and, and Russia is not unique in this. In the United States, we, we repeatedly talk about recovery from, from, from heroin addiction. You don't recover. You recover from appendicitis. You don't recover from a chronic disease. You may be in remission, but you don't recover. You've, you've changed the homeostasis of an organ system. It just happens that that organ system is a complicated one called the brain. But until that medical care system uh, recognizes that you can't use uh, acute uh, treatment for a chronic disease, um, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna affect any change in the drug treatment system. And we, have, we did a study probably five or six years ago interviewing both senior narcologists and junior narcologists in the hopes that the junior narcologists might be a little more open to change, and we were disappointed to find out that no, they were parroting their, their professor's um, beliefs uh, about the efficacy of care. They knew their care wasn't working. Mind you, none of them believe that, that the way they are treating addiction is working, but they blame the patients. You know, it's not, it's not medicine that doesn't work, it's my, my patients are, are refractory, which is, of course, quite preposterous when there are clear studies in the medical literature that, that indicate that there are successful ways to treat 70 to 80 percent of, of opioid-dependent, opioid-addicted individuals um, with long-acting uh, opioid medications uh, buprenorphine or methadone, um, which are perfectly safe and uh, prevent crime, uh, reduce social dislocation, bring families back together, allow people to work um, in, in, in non-Russian settings. And, you know, but, but, but um, the ability to even talk about this is suppressed in Russia now. Uh, my colleagues in Kazan, who especially 
a man by the name of Dr. Mendelevich, um, who, who uh, you know, was a big proponent of methadone, has been basically silenced. And, and that will continue um, from the top down. It's less, less the case in the infectious disease community, um, because there's no prohibition on using the effective drugs. What's the problem there is that the government keeps reducing the amount of drugs they're providing to an, a growing population of HIV positive people. So you've got the number of people going up, you've got the amount of drugs that you can give them going down. Um, most parts of the world, um, you know, we're increasing toward this 90-90-90 goal. Um, in, same, in Russia, um, we're moving further away from it. Um, just to follow on that, I'll plug a study that you and Olga and some of your colleagues published recently um, that runs counter to one of the common arguments made by the Russian government, Russian narcologists, that if you legalize opioid substitutes like methadone, you'll simply be replacing one addiction with another and that you'll end up with this giant black market for methadone on the streets of Russian cities. And you published a study recently indicating that that's already happened. Thank you very much. Um, that. Uh, that methadone is a very commonly used street drug now with a thriving black market. Um, to follow up on, on Harley's point, I think it's also interesting to situate Russian government policy within international politics as well and ask questions about the role of pressure from international governments and in particular from Western governments on Russian government policy. And it's important, I think, to recognize that that's very much a changing landscape. If you go back to the original days of uh, Putin's Reagan-esque behavior back in the early 2000s when the Russian government was not willing to say HIV AIDS out loud. And that's a situation that changed back in 2005, 2006 when Russia was about to host the G8 summit in St. Petersburg. And so it appears as though wanting to, um, especially in an environment where the G8 was just beginning to discuss infectious disease and HIV AIDS and development um, quite a bit more strongly than it had been in the past. Um, Russia could felt as though it could hardly step onto that international stage and be accepted into that community of Western nations without at least acknowledging that it had an HIV situation of its own. Um, with the dramatic turn in US-Russia relations in the last few years, what you have now is a situation where very frequently um, Western pressure, uh, you know, Western Western sort of haranguing about this issue um, frequently becomes counterproductive and just causes the Russian government to retrench more and more back into, uh, into the corner of the irrational policy that puts people at risk. Hi, uh, my name is Ricky Gandhi. I'm with the American Security Project. I had uh, two questions regarding to the stigma. I know in your presentation you mentioned that depression could contribute to the stigma. And I'm wondering like what the coefficient value of that would be, like how much does depression contribute to that? Because then my thought is, well, um, one proxy treatment could be treating depression, which could treat the stigma, which could help with um, HIV AIDS treatment, right? Um, and then the second question, stigma, is um, dealing just with re religion, because as you might know that Russia is a uh, socially conservative country and they're very orthodox. I'm wondering how much um, like personal religious beliefs uh, contribute to that self-perception of stigma and like uh, the lack of wanting to get care. Excellent questions, but I don't think I can answer them. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the data on depression and stigma are cross-sectional, so I can't tell you what causes the other. They're just related um, significantly, but um, um, so I can't answer that question. Uh, we did not ask more than a single question about, about religion and spirituality. It was not associated with stigma, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a detailed probing question of people's religious beliefs. How often do you go to church? Uh, do you train your, you know, were you trained in, in, in the rites of rit and rituals of the church by your parents? Do you train your children in these rituals? All the things that you would need to sort of quantify uh, religious commitment. So I can't, unfortunately, I can't answer that question at all. But they are good questions and they're worthy of further study. So, um, you know, let's find some people who can do that. <laughs> I just add one. 
Just to add one point to that, to be fair to the church, um, even though the care they provide is more on their own terms than, than we would probably like, I think it's important to acknowledge that the Russian Orthodox Church is one of the few providers of some high quality care to people living with HIV and AIDS in Russia. And you'll notice on the, my acknowledgement slide that we have uh, a, a church organization that's actually housed in the Nevsky Lavra in St. Petersburg that runs a needle exchange program that, that put us in contact with people for our, our respondent-driven sampling um, recruitment of, 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 of the study Judy, ref, Judy referred to, where we recruited 800 drug users. So um, yes, there are, like everywhere else, um, religious communities uh, run the gamut. They are not. They're not quite as, 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 as monolithic as, uh, as perhaps the Kremlin is these days. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. I'd like to pose to both of you uh, an unreasonably broad question or topic for your comments, which is looking at this issue within the broader context of changes in the Russian healthcare system. Now, traditionally, this is a country that has had a focus on inpatient care in very large facilities with large numbers of beds and looking at the traditional kinds of medical problems of societies going back before you know, uh, we had antibiotics. I mean, basically treating infectious diseases. Now, they've slowly been trying to reorient toward lifestyle-related problems leading to such high levels of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, premature mortality, other problems. You are working on a problem that is both infectious disease, a very ferocious one, but also a lifestyle-related disease. And you're trying to do this mostly through outpatient uh, facilities, uh, reaching out to get at a population at risk which is very different than pe putting people in beds for long periods of time, which is their traditional tuberculosis uh, care approach still in Russia. I'd like to get a sense of, since you, you, both of you work with people in Russia who work with these problems in this changing context of what is health care in Russia, and particularly at the moment when there is a government effort to try to reduce the cost of health care in Russia, uh, with results that are becoming quite controversial. I'd like to get a sense of what are your impressions from the people you interact with about not so much just focusing on HIV, AIDS, and strong usage, that's just, but how this relates to the changing character of where is healthcare in Russia going more broadly? Uh, what do people think uh, on that issue and seeing it f through the focus of this issue that you've been discussing today. I know that's an extremely broad question, but I don't pose it as so much as a question as, as, as a, t a topic for whatever thoughts and comments you may have. You want to, you want to start on that one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of, of reactions to that. One is that despite continued efforts at reform dating back to the late 1980s before the Soviet Union collapsed, um, the structure of healthcare in Russia is still very much um, silos. Um, and so it's very difficult, especially for something that is so stigmatized and so marginalized, to put uh, HIV AIDS and drug addiction um, within the context of the broader healthcare system because it's so set apart in, it, in its own box still, um, you know, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of funding, um, in terms of everything else. Um, Thinking about efforts to reform the Russian healthcare system, and you mentioned the need to, uh, to do more that, with less, which is something that we've talked about, the gross inefficiency that dates back to the Soviet era, and, and really the continuing inefficiency that's largely a product of that Soviet legacy lingering uh, today, 20 years later. And so you've seen an effort um, broadly defined, I'm not sure how much this extends into HIV AIDS and infectious disease care more broadly and, and addiction care, but, but an effort to come up with policies that try 
to wring more benefit out of every last ruble that they spend. Um, as you indicated, this is a healthcare system that still grossly overspends on inpatient care, hasn't figured out how to make their transition to um, delivering care in ambulatory settings where it's medically appropriate, uh, trying to have you know, family or general practice physicians rather than specialists take care of every little bump and scrape and, uh, and you know, ear infection, which normally sends most Russians running to a specialist rather than to a to general therapist, um, trying to train those general therapists to be able to handle a broader spectrum of, uh, of cases, and quite frankly, also closing down redundant facilities um, where you just have you know, too many inpatient beds that are that are still social in nature. Um, you know, there where you have you know higher bed occupancy during the winter because there are old people who are chronically sick who just kind of need a warm place to to sleep when uh, when heating supplies are are irregular. Um, and so they've tried to do that over the last couple of years as budgets have declined, as the sanctions and the financial crisis have led to a, to a bigger budget crunch. That's controversial everywhere. It was controversial when we went through our HMO phase here in the United States. Uh, you know, it, the insurance structure is controversial in, to the extent that insurance companies play that gatekeeping function for care uh, here. And so uh, I, if I would dare to make a broad statement about Russia's healthcare system, uh, in some senses, it's a sign of progress and hope that we can at least talk about some of the structural changes that they're trying to make using the same vocabulary that we've talked about changes in the structure of the healthcare system here in the United States in terms of trying to figure out provider payment mechanisms and, uh, and other sorts of incentives that that draw you toward more efficient use of resources. And many of the controversies that you're seeing are very similar to ones that we've seen here. I, I don't have much to add, and, and certainly my experience is, is constrained to the places where I've had the opportunity to interact more with the, the medical care system, um, which is really, well, I've done studies in, in a number of Russian cities, 10 or 12. I've really only act, interacted with the medical care system in, in St. Petersburg and, and Kazan. I guess I've been very lucky that way um, to interact with people who, who recognize um, that uh, if you deal with this um, chronic disease of HIV as, a, as an outpatient phenomenon, um, you can keep uh, people from being hospitalized. The, um, aid, the AIDS Center in St. Petersburg spent large amounts of money beginning seven or eight years ago to modernize first its uh, outpatient facility. And only in the last two or three years has it, has it modernized its, 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 its inpatient hospital facility that's located about a kilometer away. So my experience with this one, and I, I, I agree with Judy that uh, the healthcare system, the healthcare elements of the healthcare system are highly siloed, and they don't really talk much to each other. Um, just getting the TB people and the, and the HIV people to talk to each other, even though TB is one of the leading causes of mortality among people who are HIV positive, has been been a struggle in itself. And of course, there's a the whole system. Um, that because a large number of the of the people who are HIV positive are drug users, a significant percentage have been um, incarcerated. There's no system in place to transition people, even if they are fortunate enough to get HIV care in the prison, to being retained in care once they're released back to the community. And certainly vice versa, people who are incarcerated um, don't, do not go into prison with the guarantee of receiving the care they might have been receiving in the community. Whereas in this country, the only place where you are guaranteed medical care is in the prison system. Mm -hmm. which, which of course says something about our healthcare system. <laughs> 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 and the same thing is true that in America, people use the prisons as a way to stay warm in the winter. <laughs> uh, Marjorie Mandelstam Balzer, Georgetown University. Uh, I have a question that follows up on some of the regional implications, and maybe we can get a little bit more um, glimmer of hope in the variations. Uh, and I understand that your focus and experience uh, has been especially in St. Petersburg and, 
and Kazan, but for both of you, and um, especially Robert, because I think you were being maybe a little bit modest about your understanding of all of Russia, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about some of the cultural and political implications of where some of the better cases are. If we can maybe end this by talking about possibly some other areas besides Tatarstan that might have a little bit better track record on some of these issues. I'd love that to come out now. Um, where, where have some of the places that are bucking the uh, trends on antivirals and um, other issues, uh, needle exchanges uh, been salient? And are there implications here for, you know, ethnic dimensions to this. I, I, I'm bringing this up partly because I think some of the republics have better track records than, than other regions, but not necessarily, whether it has to do with the role of the church or um, even Tatarstan case and the issues of, of Muslim identity. Um, can we get some more regional variation into this picture? Uh, I think the first piece of, of regional variation we need to, to think about is where the HIV epidemic actually is focused. And it's focused in those places that have a, enough money and concentrated populations to um, support uh, a black market of imported heroin. In, in, in many parts of Russia, uh, when people are abusing opiates, they're making them themselves from poppies. And um, I I've, have some lovely photographs that we took in a kitchen of, of people doing this. I've done it in the lab myself with a license from the Drug, Enfor Drug Enforcement Administration. Um, uh, to, to, to demonstrate that this product it cannot be responsible for transmitting the virus. And in fact, when you look at this as an ec ecologically, you can see that only those places that have made the transition from homemade heroin to commercial imported heroin, uh, either from the stands or, or, or you know, Central Asian Republics or Afghanistan, have experienced uh, HIV out, outbreaks and epidemics that have pushed the prevalence in the populations to this high 30, 40, 50, 60 percent um, level of, of, of prevalence among in people who use drugs. Uh, that being said, um, it's then very hard to know um, the impact of some of the places that I have visited where we've seen what appear to be working uh, HIV prevention and care systems. Uh, I saw this going on when I visited um, uh, Khabarovsk uh, in the Far East. And, you know, their AIDS center was, was efficiently run. Um, they had a needle exchange program. But they also didn't have commercial heroin, so they had very few cases of HIV, and very low likelihood for uh, for an epidemic, you know, rapid epidemic spread. Now I don't know what's happened. Habero, you know, this was a, a decade ago. Now I would love to go back. I liked I liked the people. I liked visiting. It would be fun to go back. Um, haven't had the opportunity. So I, but if you look at the data, the the surveillance data suggests that. The conditions, situation there has not changed, and HIV is still very low. There are other places that used to have very low HIV prevalence um, that are beginning to see massive increases among those places. Uh, Novosibirsk, and Novosibirsk probably has a large enough population and enough money to have developed a commercial heroin market over the past decade. Um, so that's the underlying um, uh, features. I, of course, I worry that the current economic uh, situation uh, in Russia and, and the political stagnation um, and concentration of power at the top will result in a lot of disillusionment among young people who then might, again, turn in a, in a new wave of, 
of uh, a, a recreational drug use followed by um, you know, substance use disorder um, to see a whole new generation of people uh, using drugs, injecting drugs, and infected with HIV. I don't, I haven't, don't have the evidence that that's happening, but I think the economic and social situation makes that highly possible. I'm not going to say probable because I'm, I'm not a prognosticator, but certainly makes it possible. And I don't know if that's going to happen. Um, we'll, well, I'll leave it at that and let, let, let Judy comment. Well, Marjorie, when you asked the question about regional variation, you proposed that it might be cultural, it might be ethnic, it might be religious, and you know, then we hear about the fundamental structure of the epidemic playing a role in regional variation, uh, perhaps in policy response. My own experience, um, not just with HIV, but with healthcare in general around Russia, is that the most persuasive explanation for why some regions do better with others is individuals that you have individual scientists, individual academic, academics, individual policymakers, individual government officials who through a variety of situations just manage to, to position themselves as policy entrepreneurs and, and manage to push a, an environment forward that's different from what we see at, at other places in Russia. And that, um, I mean, that leads me to a broader point, which is that in this era of highly constrained relations between the United States and Russia and between the Western world and Russia, um, one of the ways that we can continue to make a difference for people living with drug addiction and with HIV AIDS in Russia is to do everything we can to maintain scientific exchange. That it's the value of that implicit ongoing support for knowledge building, capacity building, for those current policy entrepreneurs in Russia and hoping to create new generations of policy entrepreneurs in Russia. Um, that's one of the few levers that we have left. Um, and so, you know, make a plug for continued funding for people like Robert and Olga and the kind of work that they're doing. Do we have any other questions? Um, if, if not, I think we'll, we'll end the session on that hopeful note. Um, we have lunch here. Um, but join me in thanking the speakers for an excellent presentation.